Hello and welcome, Bravehearts. Thank you for joining us on our very first Rethink Show. Rethink Fit Show to help you rethink fit. Why? Because being fit goes beyond strength and appearance and endurance. It requires that we take action for our mental, emotional, spiritual, and functional selves too. I'm Jeff. And I'm Mindy. And our background is really has been in the fitness and the wellness industry. We help start what's known as the natural bodybuilding movement and fitness model search events. And we ran those events all around the world. And having witnessed thousands and thousands of athletes and personal trainers and gym owners and fitness enthusiasts, we got to really see that being fit, like Mindy was saying, goes so much beyond just strength and appearance. It's about the mental, the emotional, the social, the physical, the functional health too. And we've developed a whole concept to help people rethink the way that they're looking at life, rethink the way that they're looking at fitness, rethink the way that they're looking at their own self-care. So this Rethink Fit Show is where we interview athletes and models and experts and role models that truly represent what it means to be fit, where they get to share their wisdom, their information, their inspiration, and their insight to help you go on your journey of self-care. On each and every show, you will notice that each of our guests are going to issue a call to action, which is a simple action step that any of you can take to make gains, whether it's in mindset or in your mind, it's whether it's in your mind, your body, your heart, or your spirit. So on this show, we're live on Facebook, on YouTube, on Rumble, which means you get to participate. Ask this your is, questions. Yeah, this is a show for all of us to join in on a conversation. So ask your questions and we'll do our best to answer it. When Mindy was talking about action steps, it's providing you an opportunity to take simple steps on your journey of transformation. So you'll find out from Tony what he's going to issue today. Uh, he's our guest. I'll tell you more about him in a moment. And when you take an action step, it's for you to make some notable gains in your life and to share your story and win. Win what? <laughs> well, the opportunity to come onto this show as a guest, the opportunity to be in one of our books, which are all about empowering people through laughter and wellness, and put your message into that. Today on the show, we have a special guest, Tony Priddle. Now, we've known Tony for many, many years. We've worked together. He's been instrumental in helping us put together this whole initiative, right? Yeah. Uh, Tony is a past professional athlete and he has his own story of transformation go and growth. He's retired from the in industry now and he helps coaches and athletes to excel by focusing on their mindset. Tony is a sports science major. He is a memory remapping expert and he'll tell you a little bit more about that. He's a master NLP practitioner and an advanced hypnotherapist. Uh, so welcome Tony. Hi, Jeff and Mindy. It's been, a, it's been a long time, so it's great to be here, and um, I'm looking forward to working with you on this new show. <laughs> That's awesome. And for everyone who's listening in, again, if you have questions, reach out, put them right there in the chat, and we'll do our best to answer them. Tony is calling in from Australia, so I know we woke him up. It's now, what, about 3.30 in the morning for you? <laughs> good morning. <laughs> so good morning. It's, it's nice and early. <laughs> So, Tony, you were a big-time athlete at, some at one point in your life. Tell us about some of those highlights and what were some of the ahas that moved you on a different trajectory? Well, so growing up, all I wanted to do was actually represent my country uh, playing sport. It didn't really matter what sport. I was um, fairly talented in a few different sports, and I had the opportunity to either play professional rugby league or go to the AIS, which is the Australian Institute, Institute of Sport, and uh, have the potential to go to the Olympics as a uh, flat water rower. So it really didn't matter um, what I did in the sporting field. It was, I was always competitive and sport was just a part of my life. Sport and training were a part of my life. So the opportunity to get paid to run around a sporting field was um, a dream come true for me. 
it was li- it was literally something I dreamed about all my life and something that I pursued and something I was very good at. However, I don't believe I achieved my full potential. And this is one of the reasons I'm here today is because I think I've found a way that we can actually access our true potential um, in any thing we're trying to be great at or trying to even just trying to be good at our life, our lives. Um, and what I've worked out, the biggest aha moment I've had is that our mind is as important to train as our physical body. Absolutely. And what do you mean by that? Well, in the last 10 years in working with people with, with their minds and the, education I've given myself over that time, I've worked out a lot of different, a a lot of different things that I just didn't get told or wasn't educated on as an athlete. So we got hours and hours of the physical training to basically play a sport, but we didn't get taught any of the other skills like confidence, self-belief, self-love, um, how to how to deal with emotions how to literally cope with other aspects of life because as a 18 year old leaving a town of 3,000 people going to the biggest city in the country um going to study at university and being thrown into a the biggest or one of the two biggest sports in the country um There's a lot of stuff that goes along with that. We're talking about um, media, fame, um, the benefits that come with that, uh, money. And there is is no education. You're you're virtually thrown to the wolves. You either sink or you swim. You either get it or you don't. And... Well, I'm sure you'd see it over there in the, in the States and Canada and whatnot, that a lot of athletes, especially professional athletes, uh, go off the rails and can't handle certain situations that they find themselves in. And that's basically a mental skill. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we saw that so much in, in the fitness world. You know, someone who... Uh, You know, there'd be cases where someone was a first-time athlete, right? And they would win uh, an event and all of a sudden the media is directly in in their face. There's sponsors, you know, wanting to sign them. And they get this huge attention. And uh, like you're saying, if you're not prepared for that mentally or emotionally, uh, it could either propel you into a situation where you're acting as someone who you're not or it goes in in a downward spiral. But either way, that individual, what we found, wasn't coming from a place of authenticity because they were just, like you're saying, just thrown into something brand new. Suddenly they're a superstar, whereas like the day before they were just a regular person. But being a superstar, they felt they had to act like that and it suddenly wasn't them and there was a disconnect. So there was no mindset training. Yeah, well, and this is the whole... One of, one of my passions is actually to try try to find out what we're really capable of. And the mind-body connection is so important to that. And if we can, if we can understand uh, a few basic things about ourselves and, and some basic stuff about how our mind works, and, well, it's, it's not too basic because it is uh, not taught in the mainstream and... We can, we can, I, I think we'll have a, there's a lot more actual genetic potential we'll be able to access if we can understand and get our mind in the right place. Because there's a, there's a big connection between how you feel. Um, so just recovery, for example, uh, big, big connection with how you feel and whether you're going to be recovering or not in between the training sessions. So one of the biggest things that you could think of in professional sport or, uh, bodybuilding or um, even in well general life even at work if you're not recovering in between and don't give you don't give yourself a chance to recover 
you're just going to slowly pull your body apart. And that's going to lead down the track to injuries and, um, you know, probably chronic illness. It would be another thing in the, in the, in the general population world of uh, being in, in constant stress through not being able to control the mental and emotional aspect of what you're actually dealing with. Yes, yeah. where, your mind go, your, where your mind goes, your body follows. So that's exactly correct. So what did you notice that allowed you as an athlete to suddenly realize that training your mind is also important? Well, <laughs> that's, that, the, the sad thing about that is I didn't actually get, that, get to do that as an athlete. I only found out at 40 that I could actually change my mind. I, I've, been inter I've been interested in self-help like virtually all my life because I've wanted to be the best I can be. However, I didn't find anything that worked to, have a, to make a significant change in my um, ability to cope in the world until I was in my 40s. So as an athlete, I was... Uh, I basically had six years playing at professional level and then I, my body actually broke and I had two years out of the sport. So that, that left me with a just above average career and I was playing in the, you know, the elite, the elite competition in this country and I got six years out of a body that, virtually just packed up and said, we're not going to do this anymore because of the constant um, stress on stress in connection with training and then the mental aspect of in-between training sessions and not being able to cope with the, with the whole situation. So the aha moment didn't come when I was an athlete. The aha moment came when I was... 40 to 45 and worked out that your mind can be changed and it can be changed permanently if you have the ability and the skills to understand how it works, why it works like it does, and then how to change it. Yeah. I mean, even from the comments that I'm seeing people put up about how powerful your thoughts are, and how much of an influence that has to, to you and everyone around you. you know, I remember when we were running the events, at that time, our focus was really on the body. That's what we knew, and that's what we knew to, to share. In fact, uh, a slogan that we had was, eat, sleep, train, repeat, compete, right? Yeah. And there was nothing even to share. The, the sleep part was, you had to take that day of rest. But for most, that was just, okay, I'm just not going to work out today. There was no emphasis on what to do in that time to keep yourself mentally prepared. I mean, from, from the fitness world, uh, a lot of the athletes understood the visualization aspect, although they may not have recognized that as the word, right? They just knew, okay, picture yourself on stage, picture what you want to make your body and, and create it and build it. But they had no understanding of the other energy force that they had available to them if they were to tap in. Just like you saying, during your athletic career, you didn't know that part. It was after. Uh, so I think that's so key. So if you were to look back in the industry, and I know now you help to train coaches and you help teams to understand what they need to put into play. So what specifically are you putting into their awareness? And how would you, if you were to look at you know, you're sitting at the, the top of the, the sports world and now you want to inject a new level of awareness and education. What, what would you tell them? Well, my whole program starts with one question and that's tell me who you are. Because if you don't know who you are, or more importantly, uh, know who you're not or what you're not, mm -hmm. you, then, you then don't have any flexibility because if the... The question revolves around you being able to disassociate from, well, essentially our emotions. Because our emotions aren't. Our emotions are created by the brain based on your past experience. 
And this is this is the, probably one of the keys to understanding yourself and understanding the why you think the way you think. And that is you never make a conscious decision ever. Our brain doesn't react to the outside world, to the stimulus coming in from the outside world. Your brain predicts how you are going to be in any situation what your action, what your emotion, what your thought is, what the movement you are making 600 milliseconds before you are, before you make that action, emotion, awareness. So the key here is to understand that your brain predicts everything. It does not react to the world. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, that's so important because think of how much further people would go, you know, playing any type of sport or just in, in everyone's daily life, you know, to just be able to grasp that. Because I think, you know, in the sport that you played in, in rugby, and if I look at it, you know, in the, in the sport of bodybuilding, uh, at, at least at the time that we were doing it, you're dealing with a lot of very, very strong egos, very, very strong personalities, and who would have never really approached the emotional aspect right or the mindset aspect because that was too woo woo right yeah uh, so are you seeing that now evolving you know as you're working together with teams or, or watching the industry it's really interesting when you when you work with someone um and they they actually start to get a start to get a grasp of this the side effect or the direct effect of doing the work and understanding who you are and what you're not, how to actually start to remap memories. Because it is the past experience that you've had up until this point in time which creates which creates your personality. So and understanding what your personality is, your personality is the software that's been written from the time you're born till now that gives you the ability to interact with the incoming stimulus because the incoming stimulus that's coming through your five senses is irrelevant until you make it relevant by your past experience and what do does you, that make sense guys it does but can you expand and elaborate on what you mean by making it relevant yeah and just uh, before that just anyone who has any questions we are live on facebook and youtube and rumble if you have any questions Put them up in the chat. We'll see how we could uh, uh, get to those answers. But yeah, go ahead, Tony. So you so you, you've heard of the of the word perception, right? So it's the way you perceive the information coming in, and I can guarantee that everyone in the world will have a different perception based on the based on the information and based on the way they're trained. And what I mean by trained is how they live in the world. So remember, the personality is a, a type of software that's written that allows you to interact in the 3D world, which is the world that we live in. If we want to get, if we're not happy with the way we're acting in the world or the way we're being in the world or the way we're showing up in the world, we just we have to be able to rewrite the software because remember, our brain predicts how we're going to act. We're on a 600 millisecond delay, and this is what's really not taught. Everyone is taught, and it, and it seems like this to be true, that we react to things from the outside world. Like our, when we, we're not a reaction creature, where brains are predictive creature. Mm -hmm. And how do we know this? Because... Will, will you use an example of baseball? There is not enough time for the nervous system to act when a baseball pitcher throws a ball. There's not enough time to see the ball, look at where the ball is going, and then swing a bat. The bat is swinging virtually as the ball leaves the pitcher's hand. Huh. It's based on a batter having been thrown a, thrown a ball at them so many thousands of times, they are able, the brain is able to predict the projection of the, the trajectory of the ball 
so it can be hit. We are not, the brain's not fast enough in the neural connections and the, and the um, sending signals down into the body to be able to see that ball, know where it's going, and then swing the bat after it's left the pitcher's hand. So if we can understand it, we, we would not be able to play virtually any sport if we didn't have this predictive mechanism in our brain. So then would, so, you, would you say that that is, uh, you know, as an athlete, getting into that flow state, right? Because you're just letting the motions take, take course. You're, you're letting that flow. You're not, you don't have thought as to, like you're saying, you can't, you can't when the ball's coming at you at 100 miles or <laughs> an hour or more, you don't have that time to do that. So you have to be able to enter this, this flow state that, you know, athletes go into, especially extreme sports athletes. Yeah, flow, flow states are, flow states are a, a brainwave state, which is really, it's, a, it's really interesting that in a regular beta brainwave state, which, which is what we're sitting and talking in now, our brain's processing about 2,000 bits per second. We know that when, you go, when athletes get into a flow state, we're going into an alpha theta um, alpha theta brainwave state, which is down into in between um, hypno, hypno, hypnotherapy and meditation, essentially. So the alpha theta borderline, our brain's actually able to process around 11 million bits of information instead of the 2,000 bits of information. And there's a few things that happen when we go into a flow state, a couple of areas of our prefrontal cortex get knocked out. We, um, we lose our ability to judge time. Either time will slow down or time will speed up. And we lose our sense of border of ourselves. So we become one with something. And the little negative narrative voice in our head, it actually shuts down and we don't have... Um, you mentioned ego before, our ego basically shuts down. And this is an optimum performance state for an athlete. So there's a few things that happen. Brain waves change. So the state of the brain changes. We get hit with a, a cascade of um, really, really decent hormones. And then, the, as I said, those three areas of prefrontal cortex shut down. So the zone is an op optimum state. But what we're talking about with the predictive model, it is basically if we can change the software that's been developed up until this point in time, we can then change the way you predict in any situation so you have the ability to handle and cope and reduce stress and incorporate um, take, taking out the neg negative experiences you learn as a child and there's another area that comes into the education is that 75% of your personalities is developed be by the time you're eight years old. So we've got, a, we've got a situation that we're dealing with as an adult that has mostly been created before the age of eight. And there's, there's another really interesting aspect of accessing your true potential or gaining um, the ability to cope in various situations is to understand that you know, the program, the software that, that was developed, most of it happened before you're eight years old. And if most people understood that, they wouldn't, um, they, we could start really culling or becoming mindful about the emotions that we have and being able to start to get on top of them because there's, when I said the brain's predictive, we have, there is, a, there is about a 600 millisecond delay, but at, at the 200 millisecond mark, um, the 400 millisecond mark with 200, we have 200 milliseconds become aware of an emotion action a um, prediction and put an intervention in to actually stop it or change what we're doing yeah 
you know, at, at every moment, you know, take that extension or every millisecond <laughs> moment, you, we have that ability to choose whether we want to focus on the positive or the negative. You know, having that, it's first having that awareness. And I think even what you were saying and in getting into that flow state, I see Anna on, on the chat is talking a lot about, you know, being connected to source. You're just in, in a different frame than, you know, when you're thinking through each type of uh, action you're going to take based on the situation that's around you. So, yeah. So we. So what? What Anna sounds like she's talking about is what we'd call the superconscious mind, the ability to connect to source, the ability to connect to. Um, and this is this is something I didn't understand as an athlete, didn't have any clue about in my early years, and about the complete mind, body, spirit aspect of ourselves. So there, there is. We have. I believe we have a lot more abilities than we've been um, educated on. And it's a matter of actually starting to understand that we are way more than what we've been told we are. And once we start doing that, I think we're going to be able to access different parts of our um, potential. And then in the extreme of that is we know that our genes aren't our destiny. We're um, controlled by, we're controlled above the gene, which is called epigenetics. So we're actually controlled by the environment more than we're controlled by our, the structure of our DNA. So then once you get to a point where you are clear and um, concise in your thoughts, I sit there and wonder now because we're just seeing, you know, guys like Joe Dispenza, um, seven day meditation retreat and they're chain they're upregulating, you know, two and a half thousand genes in the in that seven day meditation retreat. What could we do with people in the prime of their life? Only do only training the physical side because they're playing professional sport. If we get the right mental combination with that so they can actually go to training um, and what training does is break down the body and what we need in between training is recovery and this goes for everyone, doesn't matter if you're a business person, artist, um, athlete, there is we have a sympathetic nervous system and a parasympathetic nervous system a sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight side of things and we have a parasympathetic which is the rest and relaxation i sit there and go well we don't need for athletes stress which is physical training on stress which can be mental and we're the only creature that virtually can has a has a brain that can create stress or create the sympathetic nervous system without doing any physical activity. So we create a lot of our own problems because we are constantly stressed. And this is what I found when I was an athlete. Six years of constantly pushing my body on the red line to be a professional athlete. And six years of not really mentally coping with everything that goes along with that, I combine stress on stress. I can imagine what my body could have done if I had this only one stress, which was the physical stress, and was able to recover in other situations. And now I understand um, elevated emotions and being in elevated emotions for long periods of time what that could have done to the expressions, of what, what genes could have been expressed back in the day to elevate my physical performance. So what is the key in changing someone's software mm -hmm. and elevating their emotions? Good. Well, one of the, well, the first, the first key is to understand that you are not an emotion. So this is where who am I comes into play because we, we tend to just go, well, 
this is this is who I am. This is and this is what's got me here. So I, this is just who I am. So one is to understand, and your emotions really just tell you how your brain's predicted this particular event. So one of the keys is to understand that one, you're not an emotion. Two, is this emotion the way I need to or I want to feel in this situation? So there's a couple of questions you can ask yourself. Am I this emotion? Can I, is this emotion benefiting me? Is it going to get me towards my goal or is it taking me away from my goal? Um, and this is this is obviously part of the education because if you go into an emotion and you understand the physiological outcomes of going into emotion and that is to go into the fight or flight response, go into a stress response, however you understand this and what's created physiologically in your body is a release of adrenaline and cortisol and that if we have that happen continually that's called chronic stress so your body is um going into that fight or flight mode so it needs to run or it needs to fight or it freezes so understanding emotions is probably the the most effective way of understanding how your mind is predicting an event and when you understand that it's a prediction, not a reaction, you then can start to take control because we can then, there's some pretty, well, there's some pretty simple things we can do because the great thing about being human is we can imagine something or we can visualize something as we are talking about, as Jeff, was, Jeff mentioned before, I don't, make a very big distinction between visualization and imagination because visualizations are uh, the technical term that mostly athletes use about picturing themselves doing something. Well, we could just call that imagination, right? Mm -hmm. So if, you're gonna, if we can imagine something, it is actually true to us, um, what we bring into our conscious awareness, essentially. So our imagination is just as real as something that physically happens and we we understand that through basketball uh a basketball free throw so you can imagine you go through that movement of throwing a basketball and your brain your the neurons in your brain will fire just like they fire when you actually do the throwing of the basketball mm -hmm. so what we imagine to be true and what we um do they're the, they're the same to our mind yeah there's sorry go on. so we can actually we can actually imagine a elevated emotion and it's as simple as actually just being able to close your eyes and think of a time and depending on what emotion you want to feel but think of a time when you felt the most in love when you felt the happiest when you felt ecstatic you can actually close your mind and bring that into your body because what happens when we think about something and an emotion is created it's a peptide being released into the body from the brain so when you when you have a feeling it's an actual chemical reaction in your body created by a thought so we have peptides released a peptide and we can actually get addicted to these peptides just like we can get addicted to um you know a narcotic so then if we look at it from a different perspective it's about someone really having that self-love for themselves you know even if you take it down to an athlete an athlete wants to excel in what they're doing uh, and there there's the pathway where the athlete could rely on external things uh, whether it's performance enhancing things or the dedication that they're spending on the training the repetition of those movements to get to that certain point 
And it also can be focusing on the self-love aspect so that they can get into that elevated emotion so that then they can visualize what it is that they're looking to achieve. And then it would change the entire approach that someone has to whether it's their sport, their creative outlet or you know, business or just uh, interacting in life, right, man? Yeah. It's um, also I heard from you that it's almost like a fake it till you make it. So if you're not actually feeling the emotion that you want to feel, you just imagine that emotion and bring it into yourself so that within the situation that you're in, that emotion now applies to that. Is that correct? Like pretend you're an actor. Well, yeah. Right? Be the yeah, actor. well, the... Yeah. The... You... So it comes down to what are we class as a skill. So I believe confidence is a skill. I believe that happiness is a skill. I believe that sadness or less, let, and we'll go there, anxiety is actually a skill. So, let, and I believe, and don't get me wrong, there, there's going to be people out there who have a genetic pre predisposition to being anxious or depressed, right? But with what we know about epigenetics now, we know it's a lot smaller number than the pharmaceutical companies will let on. And so if we understand how the brain works and we understand that um, it's called Hebb's law and that is what wires together or what fires together wires together. So I take it from a athletic background. If you practice something over and over and over and over and over again and you do it at a very high level you are going to get very good at the skill of hitting a baseball say so that's cool it's it's a skill to hit the baseball a emotion that's created on a neurological pathway in the brain and swinging a bat which is created on a neurological pathway in the brain are essentially the same thing. So if you practice a negative thought pattern over and over and over and over and over again, are you going to get very good at that negative thought pattern? The yeah. answer is yes. Yeah. And most people I talk to when they come in and they say they they have they are anxious or they feel anxious a lot of the time. You'll be talking to them and you'll go, well how long have you felt like this? And it'll be a year or a year or longer normally. And you will, if you explain it to them in the right way, they will, they will be able to understand that it's a it's a skill that they've practiced. And if it's something that they've practiced, I think this is the best part of it. If it's something they've practiced, can they can we do something different to unpractice that skill, or we can or can we change that skill if you've just learnt it? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So we can change some change the way someone swings a bat physically. We can change the way your thoughts are directed um, in an in an emotional context. There's really no difference. So that's why I talk about it. Talk about these things as skills. The probably the biggest issue here is that if seventy five percent of your personality is created by the time you're eight years old. The software that's been written is most of the software that's been written is normally before you're eight years old. So we've got people all over the world now acting like eight year olds when they, and I think a lot of people will be able to relate to this. Have you thrown a tantrum that seems ridiculous in a particular moment after the event? And I can bet most people will say that they have. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at an eight-year-old in action or eight and under-year-old in action because the mind doesn't understand the period of time. The mind has a, has a program that's written and this is how I'm going to act in, with, the, with the stimulus coming in and how I felt, how my body felt at the moment in time. The brain makes a prediction on how you're going to act. And we, and we call this program 
ourselves. We think it's us. Mm-hmm. It's actually not us. It's just a program. So then- when we can, when we when people start to get these aspects of this aspect of the training, the education and training, we can start to let go of past past actions, so we can create exactly what we want to be able to do in the future. So essentially, you're saying that somebody can change their personality. Absolutely. You t- you tell me now if your personality was the same at 20 than it is now. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, I mean And this I- is and this is what pe- people think that they, people think that it's just this is fixed. It's it's like having if you got an app on your phone and it's not doing the thing that you want it to do, what are you going to do? Are you going to put up with it? Or are you going to get a new app? You're going to find one that actually works for you. Or you're going to upgrade the one that you have. Or you upgrade. Yeah. Well, do, do we see that all these apps and all these programs are constantly being upgraded all the time? Yeah. Most people haven't upgraded their app from their eight-year-old self. They've actually just, so think about it. If we have 75% of our personality done by the time you're eight years old, and you have 25% of your personality built after that, what I find is most people add to the 25%. And that's where most self-help comes in. So we're putting, we're trying to put new strategies. We're trying to build on top of a really, really solid foundation. So what I've found is if we can start to rebuild the foundation, 75% of your personality, when you start to change the things that you believed happened to you when you were a child, and I'm not saying things didn't happen. I'm not saying trauma didn't happen. What I'm saying is the way you perceive the trauma was with the ability of the mind, the ability and the capacity that mind had in that moment. As a 52-year-old man now, I have a whole bunch of different things that I can add into the memories that I had when I was younger. So then I can understand what really happened in those moments and not what I believe to happen in those moments with the capacity of consciousness that I had at the time. Yeah. So, you know, to, to use the example of the programming, you know, I remember when the internet was just starting. Right, and you would log on, and you would click to get your email, and then you'd go take a shower, have a coffee, have <laughs> breakfast, and come back. Well, it's like as if someone is trying to interact today on like a, a cell phone and trying to accomplish something in today's time using that same software. I mean, it just won't work. It's like it's the wrong language, even. Right? It's just there's a disconnect, uh, and and when people are viewing the world from their model of the world. It's, well, what is their model of the world? And if their model of the world is just still trapped in that eight-year-old consciousness or awareness, then they can't take those next steps to enjoy their life or, or really enter into a, a feeling of self-love and, and happiness in a true sense. If we, if we, um, we, can, underst- if we can understand emotions and where they come from and how they're how they're produced so they're they're a feeling that you have in your body through a peptide so there's nothing really mysterious about emotions when you do that and they don't just happen they've actually been learned um if and if i can use this as a, this example if we if we get three-year-olds and put them into a room and there's black white brown um Asian, whatever's in the room, those three-year-old kids are going to interact with each other without any bias whatsoever. There's going to be no racism. There's going to be no I'm better than because I'm a particular colour, all this kind of stuff. So think about it. Racism. Uh, And think about how those kids act naturally and we are born 
without, with nearly a, nearly a blank slate, and then we're educated into the system that we're educated into. So I think our natural state is actually love and joy, and we're educated into the negative frames, the negative emotions, the negative um, situations. So... so no, go, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. I was going to. So if is <laughs> you go. Look at the end so, of the world. Yeah. So the if the negative emotions are actually trained in, we can train them out. Mm -hmm. And this is where I see the connection to potential. Because. If you look at a if you look at a scale and the vibrational frequency of a particular emotion, and this can be done with, okay, guys, tell me how it feels when you're sad. What happens to the body when you feel sad? We feel heavy. We feel slow. We feel weighed down. I think everyone can relate to that. Tell me what happens to the body when we feel joy. We are light, we are energized, and we are vibrant, right? So which energy is going to be the best energy for your physical performance? Which energy is going to be the best energy to take to work every day? Which energy is going to be the best energy to be in a relationship with? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that so, kind, of, kind of ties in. Uh, uh, sorry, you, you were still going. Yeah, so we have a energy field that's like this, this big donut around us. The more negative emotions we feel, the more that energy is drawn into us, the more matter we become, the heavier we become, the more solid we become. And the higher the levels of emotions that we feel, the bigger that field gets around us, so the lighter we become. And that sounds really similar to um, what we call in spiritual terms enlightenment, right? So how do you become lighter? You feel more positive emotions. You feel more elevated emotions. It's actually quite simple when you break it down, and it has to be simple for me because I like I played in one of the, the what you would call the dumbest positions you could play in professional sport, the most physical can, position you can play in professional sport. So it has to be simple for me. And when you when you look at it like this, to become enlightened, how about just feeling elevated emotions majority of the time? What is that going to, what effect is that going to have on the expression of the protein that's being built out of your DNA? Can we upregulate the expression of protein to create Superman? I actually think we can. So, so on that note, you know, for everyone who's watching on Facebook and YouTube and Rumble and anywhere else that you're, you're picking this up, you know, there's a Japanese philosophy called Kaizen, which is taking small incremental steps, you know, leading, you know, in, in a coarse way, you know, from what we're talking about of transformation. So that's why we're, we're so key on giving people the ability to take those action steps, you know, to, to have an action that they can take where they can notice a, a measurable gain, right, in moving themselves along. So what would you suggest someone does as, a, as an action step there where they can start to take that, you know, that first, first step? Well, the, the easiest thing someone can start to do is actually start to recognize the emotions that they're feeling in a particular moment. Understanding the emotion is a prediction, not a reaction. Once you can start to recognize this emotion, you ask yourself, is this serving me? Is this going to create a better future or is it going to create a negative future? And really simple process here 
is to have a practiced elevated emotion ready for when you start to feel the, the a negative emotion and negative emotions in brackets here because it's not negative emotions. It's just, it's showing you the way your brain's been trained to deal with this particular situation. So first thing, recognize the emotion. Ask, is it benefiting me or is it not benefiting me? Is it getting me closer towards my goal or further away from my goal? And then add a intervention into that and change the way you're feeling in the moment. And at the start, that will be a difficult process because you haven't done it before or you haven't been trained to do it. The more you do it, the easier it will get and the better you will be at it. So it's just a it's a it's a thing about becoming really mindful about how your brain is predicting an event and then having an intervention ready to overwrite the algorithm that is that is predicting that event. And this is that is one way to start to change the way the prediction the prediction will work. And You'll have to do that repeatedly, keep catching the negative emotion and slipping in an intervention. So that's one way you can actually change, and that's the, probably the easiest and fastest thing I can recommend here. But I would um, suggest if you, want to, if you want to be able to transform your mind faster, you'll need to come and learn how to remap memories. Because that that's going into those first eight years and actually changing the way your brain remembers a memory. And when you do that, the result is a instant transformation of the way your brain will predict a particular memory, predict an event in the moment. Do you, do you have an example of that? as in a memory remap? Correct. Okay. So the, the, when I started this work, I had a very decent fear of authority. So this was in my 40s. So my life has revolved around trying to prove myself to my father and then as a professional athlete, I had a bunch of these people called coaches that were dominant male figures in my life. And I had a very big desire to please them. So when I started doing this work, this was actually the first memory remap I ever did. And I was struggling to do the work because I didn't believe in what what I was being taught. However, this so when you we we have the ability to bring into our conscious awareness whatever we choose to bring into our conscious awareness. So I te I teach a skill of being able to slow the brain waves down. Sounds a bit like meditation, which it sort of is. Slow the brain waves down, and then start to bring into your awareness, bring into your conscious mind. Uh, an aspect of aspect of your mind, which is the area where we go is called the subconscious mind. So we go into the subconscious mind, and we ask we ask particular questions. And it was when was the first time that I felt a, that we felt a particular emotion. And in in this particular case, I went into my subconscious mind, and this memory came back to me in a it's in a flash came back to me that I was learning to mow the lawn. And I was six years old and my dad was teaching me to mow the lawn from the balcony. I pushed the lawn mower down one way, turned around, come back up, and I went off the grass strip. So you know how the wheels are supposed to line up and you, the mower comes up? I went off that. So I left this grass strip. And my dad was a pretty grumpy dude. So he came down off the balcony. He kicked me up the backside and went, you hopeless, and I'll blur, beep out the words that he used, you're, 
basically that I was hopeless and I couldn't do anything right. And this is when I was six years old. So from that point in time when I was six to 40 years old until I actually remap the memory, I had a fear of authority and I was struggling to, and I always had to show people, always tried to show people that I was more than what I thought I was, that I, because I didn't think I was good enough because that's the belief that was created in that moment when I was six years old. When I changed that belief or when I changed the way I saw that incident, it completely let go of the my need to prove to other people that I was worthwhile. So what, so was, the, what was it that you actually changed in that belief to help you prove that to yourself? Well, so... As a six-year-old, when your father comes and kicks you up the backside and tells that you, you tells you you can't do anything right, you think that's aimed at you. So what I what I got to understand when I could actually see that incident from six as a forty-year-old was why my father actually did that to a six-year-old. So he was a in his forties. He was a he was got forced into the job he was doing, which was a school teacher, by his father because his father was a farmer and farming was very insecure work. Working for the government was very secure. My dad wanted to be a farmer. He didn't want to be a school teacher. And he was then had a wife and three kids and he was bored with his life. So he was feeling frustrated because he was showing this kid how to mow the lawn and he couldn't mow the lawn. Oh. So the six-year-old didn't realise that dad was frustrated and he was bored and he used to go to the pub all the time to, to alter his state, to drink a white, to try to get out of his head so he could deal with the life that he was given. And don't get me wrong, it wasn't a bad life. It was just that it wasn't what he thought it was going to be like in that time. So the six-year-old then could see that his father was bored stupid and he thought he was stuck and he took his emotions out on the six-year-old. Yeah. And the six-year-old went, hang on a minute, because the six-year-old's now 40 and the memory yeah. comes back up now right? and time... Your mind doesn't have any time in it. It doesn't know you're still not six. It just it just has this emotional attachment to a thought that I'm not good enough and I've got to prove myself. So don't get me wrong. It was a great thing to get me to be a professional athlete because I had this thing. I wanted to prove myself to other people. But what got me there didn't take me any further, which is something that we, if we understand what gets us to where we are, Will not, will not get us to a further point. So when I understood this and I realised that my dad was bored and it what had nothing to do with me, I was learning to mow the lawn. Like I literally, are we allowed to make mistakes? Do six-year-olds make mistakes? Well, the answer is yes. I then had the ability to see in that moment that all my dad needed was me to actually, instead of being upset and frustrated at this situation, imagine if I was six and he did that and I, and I walked up to him and gave him a hug and went, Dad, it's okay. Like, I mean, I'm six. I learned, I'm just learning to mow the lawn. I love you. Aww. The whole thing would have, the whole thing would have just turned him and it would have turned and it would have changed me, right? I wouldn't have, yeah. wouldn't have got into that state. Yeah. The way you remember a memory is the way you remember the memory forever then. So literally I showed the six-year-old how to deal with that situation and change the way I remembered the memory. And instantaneously that belief about myself was gone. It evaporated. That, that's yeah. awesome. And I had a real-life incident that actually proved that to me. What was it? Which was, And it was really interesting. Like, where where we lived at the time, we were, 
I was driving home from the gym and I was pulled over by the police to have a random breath test. And this was this was the week before I did the belief. And I'm not, like I said, I wasn't real good with authority, so I needed to prove myself to people. So in the breath test, the, the police officer came up, did the breath test, and then he asked for, asked for my license. And I was a little bit indignant about being asked for my license when I had zero alcohol on my breath. And the, the police officer got very authoritarian and frustrated. And I started arguing with him, and it wasn't probably the best thing to be doing, right? <laughs> you think <laughs> so yeah i know it's, it's, well we now know in the last two years but we won't go into that but anyway so with that this was this was like 10 years ago so i did that did the work on that weekend the next week i was at the gym and coming home same place same random breath test so same same situation happened i what i drove up literally got my license out handed out the window said to the officer yep okay blah blah blah. i did the random breath test got my license back put in the car and drove off and my wife at the time looked at me and went what just happened (laughs) and i'm going what do you mean she went well remember last week and the difference to this week there was no anxiety no level of anything to for me to want to antagonize the police officer and there was no fear or worry in me when i drove up that second time wow wow that's a great example these this is these are the things that we 75 percent of your personality is done by the time you're eight years old yeah imagine how much stuff is there to be remapped and how much that controls your future yeah yeah Anna Uh, says, sorry, go on. So that just gives you one example of how that can change in an instantaneously change the way your brain predicts a future event. Yeah. Well, again, we're we're live here on YouTube and Facebook and Rumble. Uh, I see Anna's putting some some questions and making some some remarks. She actually says, good example. Wow, I think we all can relate in some way. Yeah. And uh, Welsh uh, asked, you know, is this something that could help him? And, you know, Welsh, I would say uh, head over to the website, uh, rethinkfit.social, and click on a button that says action steps. And you could scroll down and you could see a little bit more detail about what Tony's talking about. Uh, Tony's website is right there, which is retranscend.net. And you can can learn a little bit more. But take one of these uh, steps, you know. It's so important... Uh, on a journey of transformation, the biggest, biggest part is just starting, is doing something that's going to move you forward uh, in, in a way that's going to make you feel better. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate outcome here. And now that people are aware that you can actually change how you're feeling and your state of mind and your personality and how you're navigating yourself through the world and how you feel about yourself, it makes sense to take Tony's call to action so that you can actually make a change within yourself so that you feel better. Yeah, and you know, when you do, I'm not gonna say if, it's when you do and when you decide to make that decision, uh, you'll see on the, on the website there's a particular hashtag to use. I think it's we transcend. And connect with Tony, share your story. We wanna hear it too. We do. Uh, we wanna hear what, what ahas you have, what kind of notable gains you have. Why do we wanna hear it? Well, because I think that the more people who share allow more people to see that they can do it too. And, of course, there's prizes to be won, you know, like coming onto the show, you know, and sharing what your story is all about uh, and so many other things. But the biggest prize is you being able to have a new awareness and a new way to start to become happier and and really appreciate what what self-love and self-care is about. So, Tony, uh, as we're getting close to wrapping, wrapping things up, and it was awesome, you know, that, you know, to have had that uh, mind remapping that you did and be able to change that and to have something that the universe put in front of you one week apart to be able to show you that yeah. <laughs> it actually worked, that's got to be like that, I'm on the right track, right? Well, the, yeah, well, this is... 
it's been it's been really interesting. I've been doing this for ten years now, and it's really hard to say where the end result is going to be because I think the end result is always evolving, and I and it's a it's a process of really understanding that you are not the program. You are not your education. You are not your emotional state. You are not the country you were born in, even. So when you can start to separate these things, it makes it so much easier to understand and actually start to deal with the situations that you find yourself in. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Uh, it was awesome having you on the show today. Uh, for everyone, all the brave hearts watching, you know, Tony has been instrumental in, uh, you know, us putting together what the, this whole Rethink Fit initiative is about, which is really rethinking, rethinking the way that you do everything how you treat yourself, how you speak to others, what your energetics are like, the relationships you have, and how your mental, emotional, and physical state are. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's what this show is about. It's to help you uh, uncover and realize the, you know, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And to do that, you've got to take that first step, and that first step forward. Yeah, so as long as... You literally can't change the way you look at things until you understand the way your brain perceives information and and structures the way you're reacting in the moment. So rethinking fit or rethinking your life is essential to being able to do or get what you're actually looking for right now. What, what an awesome way to, to end off uh, our first show here. Uh, you know, this was awesome. Thank you to all the brave hearts who've been watching live on Facebook and YouTube and Rumble and everyone who's watching the replay of this. Uh, to really find out more about what's going on, go to BraveheartNation.com. You know, you can learn about the treatments and courses and trainings and holidays that you can have out here where we're at in Ixtapa, Mexico. Uh, there's the New World Practitioner, the whole life coach that's starting on April 30th to May 9th. We're going to be there. Uh, yep. The Wolf Non-Surgical starts just after that in May and wraps up on May 22nd. And uh, we'd love to see you here. We'd love to see you take part in things. Head over to RethinkFit.Social, click on the action steps and see what you can do to take your first step in a journey of loving better how you think, feel, act, look, and dream. Uh, thank you so much, Tony, for uh, getting up at 2.30 in the morning, <laughs> <laughs> bearing with us through some of the technical startups on the show. Uh, this was uh, an awesome first show and really excited for everyone out there Join us every Monday at noon central time uh, to be part of this journey and make sure to come with some questions and, and uh, we'll see what we can do to help you out with the guests that we have and everyone around. Uh, there's also a, a book that we've put out called The Ridiculous Adventures of Serbidant, which is a lighthearted comedy book where we've interwoven messages of empowerment and self-growth and self-love in a way that is fun, will make you think, and hopefully make you laugh. And you could find out more about that at uh, laughoutloud.life. Uh, so my name is Jeff. And I'm Mindy. And that was Tony. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. And again, head over to braveheartnation.com to find out how you could participate in some of the things that are going to help you move forward on your journey. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>